All right, so for our next session, we're going to do our whip lightning talk session. So I have the whiteboard up here. If your name is on the whiteboard, I need you to queue up over here in order. So come on, guys. <clears throat> I think it's all guys who signed up this time. If your name is on here, let's line up. So um, you have five minutes. I have a buzzer on my phone. So when you start talking, I'm going to start the timer. And if you go too long, here, let's see. Yeah, it's not working too well. But you will see it if it's working. Um, so my suggestion is when you go, make sure and introduce yourself as part of before you end your topic and then go. And as soon as you start, the timer starts. So. <laughs> you don't have XR and R just memorized? <laughs> I have a little... I have a little start projector and stop projector, you know, Ben SH script because I, I can't remember it either. All right. So, well, all right, we're going to spend a few minutes. He may not need a dongle. He's got HHML over here. Yeah, it's back. I, wait, I waited 10 years between Mac so that I kept an HDMI port. That's how I solved that problem. Yeah. <laughs> I also kept those. All right. Okay, so Adrian's first on deck is Max. There you go. Uh, hi, I'm Adrian. Uh, if you, I've been away for a while, so but uh, now I'm back to do more Wi-Fi, random Wi-Fi stuff. Um, so, if you've been looking at what's been going on over the last few years, uh, Bjorn's been working on Linux KPI uh, driver porting, and that seems to be going okay. The challenge, though, as he and others have discovered, is if we want to actually get Wi-Fi uh, 11ax and 6 gig and all the new funky features, um, the porting the driver is not enough. We actually have to go work on the stack some more. Uh, much to people's annoyance, um, and the stack has not aged well, so I need to do a bunch of cleanup. A bunch of us have to do a bunch of cleanup there. Um, the order of operations for why we have to care about this is at the bottom. If you want, um, w, if you want six gig, six gig mandates WPA3. WPA3 mandates a new authentication mechanism. Mandates encrypted management frames. Encrypted management frames mandates a bunch of new encryption types and a bunch of like new da uh, data path handling. And all that plumbing has to happen for every chip except Broadcom. So if you want to use it for Intel, you have to do all this plumbing. Broadcom's the only chip that fully offloads everything and pretends to be Ethernet. Uh, that's a different story today. Um, if you want to do um, uh, uh, some of the, the, the later encryption types that use larger crypto keys like 256 and 34 bit, if uh, some offices are actually starting to mandate that for, uh, for corporate 11x d d deployments, then you need to update your stack to include the, the larger crypto um, uh, um, key sizes, which our stack almost but not quite can do without some changes. Um, and as Bjorn and others found, our driver interface requires a whole bunch of like cleanup around rate control for, for working with 11AC and 11AX and a bit of 11N and a whole bunch of stuff around how we actually represent channels because all of that stuff is 25 years old now. Um, and a whole bunch of cleanup. So I've been talking to a few people about what to do about this. People were kind of hesitant to really put the uh, FreeBSD 15 in the blender while 14 was still uh, um, sort of the stable was still being um, uh, actively merged back into. But since I think 14's life cycle is sort of okay now, um, my proposal is we just sort of like draw a line in the sand and we say, okay, let's run fast on this on 15 and actually get all the cleanups and API breakages that we need to get done, just get that done in head and not try to make any of this new stuff work on 14 and just leave 14 in maintenance mode like it should be in stable. Um, uh, don't stop doing the Linux driver work because it's probably a good idea to continue doing that work and get people on board with porting those drivers and learning how 802.11 works. All that work is actually really useful. But again, as Bjorn and others have found out, there's a big gap between porting the driver and getting the driver up and having it actually speak Wi-Fi. OpenBSD has gone and ported a bunch of drivers native from Linux to OpenBSD and running them natively. They don't bother with a, with a, with a uh, Linux KPI layer. So they're actually further ahead on 11ac and 11ax than us, but their drivers run on BSD. So 
Uh, there's actually someone right now, I think it was Tom, doing a port of IWX driver from OpenBSD into FreeBSD head for us to have as a test driver just to use to finish off whatever bits are left over on 11AC. Um, and there's a bunch of figuring out how we land code because there's so much that needs to be updated. If we just get it all done, it's probably like a couple of hundred thousand lines of diff just for net 802 and 11. Trying to merge all of that at the end of 15 isn't going to be that great. But to other people's comments, continuously breaking things in head, potentially not the best way to, tr to tackle it. So we've got to find some middle ground where we, we checkpoint certain features, we get them into the tree, we get them tested and adopted, even if it's not hitting uh, all, everything we need for 11AX, at least we're heading in the right direction. Um, and I'm hoping that with an IWX driver port and some Linux KPI uh, improvements, stability improvements, and some general stack cleanup, if we, even if we don't get 11AX completely going in, 50, in the 15 time frame, we won't be that far off. Um, and the, the, what was the final thing I wanted to say? Um, if anyone's actually interested in uh, tackling more of the driver stuff, let me know, because I'd rather focus on the stack rather than having to also port all the drivers. I do driver work at work. Uh, I don't want to keep doing driver work at home. Like, it's fun, but it's only so much fun. Uh, I'd rather focus on the, the Net 211 stack and, the, and getting WAP3, WPA3 going, because that's a lot of lifting. Any questions? I don't need laptops, and I don't need hardware. I swear to God. OK? So uh, don't offer me anything. I've got it all. I've literally got it all. All right. Thank you, Adrian. <laughs> all right. Next up is Max. Hey, hey everyone, thanks. Uh, my name is Maxim. I'm a long time FreeBSD developer. I started with sports in like uh, early 2000s and uh, moved up a little bit to the food chain. Uh, so right, right now I'm uh, most of my day job, I'm managing my company, which I started with few guys a few years ago. Well, more, more like 15 now. But anyway, we use FreeBSD exclusively for our uh, software. We uh, have around uh, 300 uh, systems all over the place uh, running different versions from, I guess, 11 probably to uh, 13. Um, yeah, once in a while we hit uh, some bugs. Uh, so we had to deal with, like everyone probably in this uh, room, uh, with some uh, failed uh, asserts or some panics, uh, which happens in some production system and all you have is uh, just a message. So I was looking at some of the curious panics we got a uh, few weeks ago. Well, not no. It's more like it's going like recorded kind of panic, which happened. Um, oops. What was that? Hmm. Okay. Anyway, I'll, I'll continue with my. Uh, yeah, it is. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we, we deal with panics um, once in a while, and this one was, I believe, caused by some. I can unplug and replug and see. Uh, by some uh, stray packet um, hitting uh, hitting uh, some of the not uh, hand oh yeah it came back it came back um, but anyway story is that uh, we have uh, two two assert messages in two slightly different places in the function with the same message so we got panic and we was like oh is it this or this is this or because there is no really information, um, just uh, the message. Uh, so I was curious how we can add, um, maybe record uh, also the uh, num number of line and um, the function name as well. And I just used some of the code that I used in my other project called RTP proxy. And what it does, it basically allocates uh, a read-only structure which uh, captures uh, all those three parameters essentially, two, uh, two strings and one number. And if you don't use it, it will just be optimized out. If you use it, it's stored in a uh, read-only segment. And uh, then if panic happens, we just dump it. And it kind of makes things a little bit more uh, debuggable. So as you can see, there is a 
this stuff is new, so if I panic, uh, this uh, just uh, test panic I inserted, you see this is the file, line number, and uh, uh, the rest panic is just usually follows. But uh, this was to make it uh, more debuggable, and we have around the only downside, I guess, is uh, this will create quite uh, quite a visible uh, increase in the size if you enable uh, uh, asserts. So around uh, 17, I think uh, 17,000 uh, locations in the kernel code with some kind of assert uh, for the generic or uh, 25k for the lint. But anyway, it's in the PR, and uh, I think if somebody can review it, it would be nice. Uh, you, if you don't have like witness or any of that, uh, like, like if you don't if you don't have assertion, key assert, or if asserts are disabled, then you don't have information recorded for that. Yeah, yeah. Well. Yeah, but it, it maybe default should probably be yes if. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, makes sense. Yeah. Uh, yeah, if you have access to everything, but if it's something, uh, that you only have. Uh, I mean, it, it could be in like include file, you know, it's very difficult sometimes. Uh. Yeah, or maybe if you have uh, direct panic call. So, for example, your driver in some kind of. Yeah, I guess you want to want some. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said that it's like um Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well, uh, the, the the fact that it's useful is is actually a few of the for example, VFS has their own uh, wrappers on those uh, macros uh, which actually include the line number. So this is basically just make it uh, more uh, uh, generic and op no, no, op well, op maybe optional, but um, kind of by default. Um, I guess I'm run out, so <laughs> thank you. <laughs> no, you're all good, Max. All right, next up is Michael. I'm good. Hopefully I can do this in 60 seconds. So. Uh, thank you everyone for attending, organizing, and sponsoring the BSD cons, be it Asia BSD con in the spring, be it BSD can. We had a completely new team, and I think, uh, show of hands, did we do okay? Cool, cool. And of course, Euro BSD con, Philip busted his butt, and he has a great support team, and recently a small ZFS event in Portland, and this event. So thank you everyone who makes that happen. The, the, all those in the back who have just been quietly making it happen, thank you. Sponsors, thank you for continuing to sponsor, and my initial ask is, hey, please continue to do so. Pick an event that meets your needs, that fits your size, you name it. Now my big ask. I really want to throw out our prospectuses. We've used the same rinse and repeat prospectus with the same tiers, the same features, a tote bag of this, of that, a whatever. I want to see some creativity. And just in a few conversations this last 48 hours, people mentioned, well, at one event, we had a capture the flag device in the badge. And that was our sponsorship. And it was great for getting engagement and all that. Please reach out to me or your favorite organizer with those ideas, because I do not want to see that same prospectus with a slightly higher number and just a slight revision. Any questions? Thanks again.
right. Next up is Ross. I um, <clears throat> my name is Ross. I'm an independent developer. I don't write any compiled code. I'm probably the only one here. Um, so my things are more like tips and tricks that I had to discover on my own that I didn't necessarily get tuned into. Um, extending RC, RC is um, RC, um, but it's it's very flexible in a lot of ways. Um, it does what I call cascading configuration. One, this is one thing FreeBSD is really good at is a system configuration that can be overridden by a user configuration that, or vice versa, you know. Um, so you can write code and put it in etsyrc.conf.d instead of patching an RC script. And you can get a lot, you can uh, add functions to an RC script that way. Uh, one problem is, and I mainly see this in ports, it doesn't seem like there's a standard for where uh, rc.subber gets, inclu gets included. Sometimes it's included before uh, things run, and sometimes it's included after. And um, that does make it problematic. Um, it has to be included early. Let me make sure I have this right. So that anything that you put into rc.conf.d will be loaded as a... In other words, you can overload functions in the RC script, but only if it's included in the right order. Um, SNDIO, no pulse audio. In a desktop system, SNDIO is an OpenBSD audio server with network capability and it also has an option where you can make it um, capture the audio device or not. I don't know if I'm saying that exactly right but I have an old HP laptop. The sound driver was incompatible with suspend resume and I figured out that if I ran SNDIO instead of uh, in network mode and in unprotected mode or protected mode, I can't remember which, uh, I could unload the kernel module, shut down, bring it up, load the kernel module, and, and every piece of software was happy with SNDIO as the abstraction layer. On the no pulse audio side, I put a lot of work into figuring out all of the programs that I run that uh, have a dependency on pulse audio, and 90% of them uh, have a no pulse audio option. Sometimes that is an SNDIO option, sometimes it's not. But you can basically build your entire ports tree with a single make file that uh, eliminates pulse audio. Of course, you got to be very proactive because it basically, I don't know how it does it, but it will creep in. And on my system, if I have pulse audio installed, it will crash when it goes to sleep. It's that simple. And uh, so sometimes it ends up back on my system and I get a crash and I'm like, oh no, what's What's wrong? What's going on? And I have to remember to look. Oh, there's Pulse Audio. Get rid of that. But it is possible, I guess, is the message. How am I doing on time here? GMountVer is a great tool. Um, mount verification lets you uh, detach attachable storage without crashing the system. It just patiently waits. It suspends any I.O. requests until it gets plugged back in. So you can unplug your, I like to run my system off of USB, but you can basically unplug it while your system's running, um, plug it into your phone, copy images over, pop it back in, and you've got easy file transfer that way. Reroute is a great feature, it's fairly new. 
Um, it, it means you don't have to compile an MFS root into the kernel if you want to run from an MFS root file. So it overcomes the size barrier of MFS root. Uh, with reroute, you can basically just define the image on the file system or in memory that you want it to reroute from, and it will unmount all the file systems and basically start over from that point. So uh, for like PXE booting and things like that, it can be very useful. And then my other tip is start with a minimal kernel. Just It takes longer to load, but uh, it's way easier to troubleshoot problems if you can unload anything uh, while it's running. So that's it, thanks. Right, next up is Alan, back again. Hi, I got a tip and a trick for you. If, if your project, A, is hosted on GitHub, B, is open source, and three, C, run, <laughs> runs on FreeBSD, then Sirius CI is definitely the easiest way to set up continuous integration. And I swear, I'm not getting paid to say this. So here's my Hello World project. I started it uh, one hour ago, and I'm going to show you how fast it is to set up CI. First off, you go to cirrusci.org and click on the documentation tab. I've already put it up here. All you have to read through is this. That's it. And what it tells you is to install the GitHub application from the uh, GitHub marketplace. I have already installed that application, so my view is a little bit different than what you're going to see. Here is my personal GitHub settings page. In order to add Sirius CI to a new repository, I, uh, I scroll down, select repositories, and I find my new repository. Hello world. So, and I click save. Now I've enabled, um, there it is. You can see Sirius CI is enabled for Hello World. So I go back to my application and I need to write a CI definition. I've already copied one right here, but the part that you really need to pay attention to is this part. FreeBSD is a first class citizen on Sirius CI. No nested virtualization, no it's a type of Linux or anything. If you wanna run Sirius on FreeBSD, you just tell it which FreeBSD version you want. The rest of the file defines what we're going to do to test this application. It's a Rust application, so all we do is do cargo build and cargo test. Over here in my terminal, I do git add. Add the file. How am I doing on time, John? There we go. Yeah. So I added my CI uh, Cirrus file, and now I push to the origin. We switch back to the web browser, refresh. Ah, and you see yellow dot. My build there is queued on Cirrus waiting to run. Now, if I only have two minutes left, it might not start in those two minutes. Um, we could sit here. Sure. We could wait here for a while, or we can just. All right. We'll just leave it here, and we'll let Gleb go. Uh, hi, I'm Gleb Smirnov, and I'm about to talk about Stabilization Weeks. Uh, please raise your hands, those who know what I'm about to talk about. Not enough. Not enough. So I suggested that exactly one year ago, uh, and we started to implement this March, is that on the FreeBSD current, every uh, last week of a month, we declare it stabilization week, which means that means, means two things. Uh, please don't check in risky stuff. And ideally, don't check in anything rather than a bug fix or correction or documentation improvement or whatever. The, the second thing, you are encouraged to install this point, and we all 
who participate, we install the same point, and this helps a lot uh, to stabilize it because we all run the same. Nobody commits new stuff. We uh, stabilize it. it. In the worst case, it takes a week. This is why it's called a week. It starts on Monday morning by GMT and ends on Friday. But I think we have never, it never lasted beyond Thursday and usually it ends between Tuesday and Wednesday. So, uh, so usually it, it is closed by just by the fact that there are no reported regressions or on this civilization point compared to one month ago civilization point. So, uh, what have, so again, we started to do it in March. It means that we already had eight cycles. Uh, some of them were very simple. So, uh, so my script declares the civilization point. At Netflix, we do our own A-B testing, which is pretty large and extensive tens testing. But of course, it covers only operation of our servers. So, so it utilizes only the drivers that we use, it utilizes only the protocols that we use, and so on. But it's actually a very strong proof of that there are no regressions. I also update my desktop, I update my home router, there are other several people who also do that. And nobody reports regressions. On Tuesday, I say, everything's all right, please continue your commits. Um, this thing is going to scale. So I mean, that the more people participate in that, the more, uh, the more value we will get from these stabilization points. Uh, so I'm encouraging everybody. So b basically, one year ago, I encouraged everybody to consider that idea. Now that it's already running, I really encourage you to join it. At least start with your own uh, personal desktop or laptop. Or if you're running a company, uh, update your source base, uh, your development branch, and uh, you're not required to do it monthly. You can do it bi-monthly, because bi-monthly is dividable by month. You can do it three monthly, quarterly. You can do it annually. But participate as much as you can. Any questions? So I know in the last year, Baptiste has stood up um, package-based builders that are building continuously. I wonder if it would be possible to I don't know what the right way to describe it is. I would like a way to help with having people coordinate testing stab weeks. If we could get a package-based build for the start of every time with the template, somehow with like a consistently tagged thing so that people who want to opt into testing can easily package update, you know, and then whatever argument you need to add to say, I want to test the most recent stab week. So I don't know if that's something Baptiste can help you with, but that might help make it easier, especially if we can give a canned recipe for people to know how to test the most recent one. That might be something that might help make it easier for more adoption. David, you want to say something? Yeah, take the mic. What might be helpful is some command we can run on Freefall, much like find the IRC channel password that says, what's the status? Are you, are you in this window or out the window? If you're in the window, what is the hash or what's the base point? If you're outside, what was the previous one that's declared good? To remember where it is on a calendar and if you're in the time zones across it, some way to dynamically, just real quick and easy, what's the status? Yeah, right now it's automatic email that is sent. Uh, I, I, see, I, guess, I see what you mean. Okay, I'll, I'll shell, shell out something. <laughs> Well, one thing we can do is, um, in terms of status, we could have like a simple generated page. It gets a, like it's like a table that gets a new line with a red, red or green for every week. That could grow over time. But we could have we could have a we could have a git tag that slides forward to the last known good one. If we have a bad one, it doesn't slide forward to the next known good one. That's well, but okay. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, we could. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I got Git tags there on my personal GitHub. Uh, so back one year ago, when I suggested that, uh, there was uh, some pushback, like you are going to pollute our, our Git with your tags. So I said, as long as it goes experimental, the tags are in my repo, just you, you need to connect a second remote. Um, yeah. Okay, thanks. All right, how are we doing on, s I think we're still waiting for credits. Ha, 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 ha.
one of the disadvantages of Sirius is that if you're using a free account, it can take a while for the job to start. But Warner needs a screen now, so you'll just have to take it on faith that my code compiles. Ladies and gentlemen, the great green check of fame. <laughs> yeah, you can see cargo output. Click on green check. Click on details. View more details on Cirrus CI. And oh, that means I haven't paid money for this account. <laughs> That's why it took a couple of minutes. And there we go. We can see the cargo test worked and didn't do anything. Yeah, so the maximum time is by default one hour, but a max for free accounts on two hours, but paid accounts, you can do more if you're paying for the CPU. Okay. The answer is probably, anyway. So in case you haven't heard my name, my name is Warner Losh. I'm working on um, Linux boot. Uh, and now this time my screen isn't working. Yeah, the, it, there's a real possibility at any conference there'll be smoke or me hitting my laptop with a shoe or Anything like that. Paul Henning stopped giving talks, though, so, and I've stopped destroying laptops. I wonder if there's a correlation. Anyway, um, I wanted to give an update on uh, Linux boot. Uh, briefly, what this is, is uh, Linux has the ability to replace the kernel with a new kernel. And a lot of uh, minimal environments have gone to being, you have to use Linux boot to uh, boot everything. And so there's a whole set of tooling for Linux, but it doesn't work with FreeBSD kernels because we have a lot of extra metadata for uh, the kernel. How big is the um, memory system? Uh, what drivers are there? What uh, modules are there? What tunables are there? All of this stuff is not uh, preserved, um, or the, the Linux tools don't know about it. So I took um, our bootloader and made it a Linux binary. You can compile it as a Linux binary. It loads everything up, and then it calls the right calls uh, kexec load, which puts it all into memory, and then uh, reboot with a special uh, argument which says take that memory, copy it to the right place, and then jump to it. And then from there, weird things happen, and then our kernel starts, and uh, we boot. And this works great on ARM64. Um, I've run this on uh, QEMU and three or four experimental systems that I think I'm still under NDA on. Um, that are various flavors of Neoverse uh, cores, and it works great. Um, I've just started working on AMD64. We get into the kernel, and the metadata isn't right, and we panic, because I don't know why. I mean, if I knew why, I would have fixed it, and beyond to the next one, I don't know why. Um, there's a couple of things, though, that aren't working. Um, right now, we assume PA equals VA for any callbacks into UEFI, and that's not strictly true. There's um, a virtual memory address uh, that, or virtual memory mapping table that you need to get from EFI um, to uh, set and make the call and then reset. Kind of like any other process, it has its own virtual memory. Um, and I've been going round and round with Caustic because um, in my world, all of this works and is great. In his world, he's got too many laptops that lie. Uh, and he thinks there's more laptops that lie than are perfect servers. And he's probably right. So we're trying to figure that out. Um, a couple of other minor problems. Uh, we support 4K pages on ARM64, but not 16K pages. Um, that came on while I was doing this project. Um, and uh, Drew's asked me to do that. Uh, and there's also a couple of missing features. Right now, there's no networking support, so you can't. Um, run the bootloader to load, a, to grab a kernel via HTTPS. Um, and so uh, the interesting thing that was in today's talks 
where the work at Juniper for the rescue kernel, the crash dump kernel. If you can have a crash dump kernel, then if we generalize it a little bit, then we can load our own kernels and do FreeBSD to FreeBSD KXX. And that's something I would love to do. It's not something I'll finish this year, but um, that's uh, got a lot of uh, interesting follow-on potential to the uh, very useful uh, rescue kernels that were talked about earlier today. So I thought I'd try to draw that together, that these, these can be quite related and quite useful um, uh, for different features. Uh, so anyway, are there any questions that people have? We need to give him his own mic. Uh, here. Hold on, here. For those of us that have had our head in the sand, what are the platforms that only support a Linux boot? What, what environment are you forced into this? Um, so there's a number of ARM64 boards that different vendors have that they have opted not to do the full uh, EDK2 support. Um, they just port the tiny bit of uh, EDK2 that's specific to the board, and then they jump directly to the Linux kernel for all the other drivers. Um, <coughs> uh, yes, instead of having U-boot. Right, right. So they, they, they don't write the individual drivers for the different uh, serial ports and video things. And um, I can't really get into the ones that I, I work on, but... Uh, it's basically their deeply embedded custom boards or their uh, evaluation hardware that um, boots Linux and has UEFI, but FreeBSD's bootloader doesn't work with that, but kboot works. So we just said, oh, we're not going to make them fix it. We're trying to do a quick eval. We'll just use the tool that we have that works. So I don't know. I imagine one of the things I, I, I hope to be able to do is to have this as a springboard for any cloud service that's Linux only. If they have the right support in the kernel, then you can um, boot the Linux kernel and then reboot into FreeBSD and everything is good. It's kind of what, it's, it's kind of what the hope is, but um, I have to get it like booting at all so I didn't put my hopes and dreams on the slide. Uh, so, other questions, right here. And it's very interesting. So does it mean that after this is uh, uh, merged, uh, whatever, I will be able to basically boot FreeBSD from Grub or something? Uh, like, like basically use any Linux loader to boot FreeBSD kernel as well? Uh, not just any Linux, uh, lo any Linux loader that supports um, KXX. So um, it's platform by platform. There's also a PowerPC support for the old PS2, uh, PS3, sorry. Um, I have a PS3, I had reasons. <laughs> um, somebody, somebody gave it to me to make this work. Um, uh, yeah, because I haven't been able to get it to work. I tried, I tried the CD that they said guaranteed would absolutely work, no problems, I'd have no hassle. It's been nothing but hassle. But uh, it has not updated. It's the right firmware. I did check that. Uh, so, yeah. So I, I, it's a significant hassle, and I think it's the, the, it's broken anyway. So I'm not going to worry about it. But um, you know, when the uh, MD64 goes in, you'll be able to do boot that if it uses a boot from UEFI. If it's a BIOS boot. I'm not going to support that, um, even though that's common in uh, for things like core boot, um, because it's just a, a, a whole second path into the kernel that I have to get right, and I'm being significantly traumatized by the first path. So, uh, I, 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 unless somebody has a compelling reason, I'm not going to do that. Just a statement for David. Um, all the like embedded Atom stuff does um, UEFI straight into Linux and then the KXAC. So like all that embedded like file server stuff you can buy cheap, all of that stuff using Atom stuff, it's all it's all like looks like embedded Linux rebooting a uh, cut down UEFI that doesn't boot FreeBSD. It only boots Linux. It doesn't have all the interfaces required. It's just enough to like suck a Linux kernel in off a particular flash storage chip and then just kicks it to start and then it chain boots through KXAC. 
there's, why have two separate BSP teams when you can only have one BSP team that does all the drivers for Linux? That's what happens. So the interesting use case I can think of, just related to what I was talking with Colin about um, the challenges of doing CI for an operating system, which is you want to build an image and then you want to boot the image. And you don't want to do the thing we do today, which is to bit on nested vert or something crappy like that. Have you considered, if you have k-exec, um, a CI pipeline where you build an image and then you k-exec the new kernel to run your, your CI? Uh, I have considered that. Also, I've considered, the, so right now it would have to be we build it on Linux, k-exec FreeBSD and, and do the thing. But with, um, with the Juniper stuff, potentially we could do that. We would need to do, in order to do the k-exec to do the testing, though, we would need to be able to load the kernel in after um, we uh, boot. And right now it's compiled in, and I've got some suggestions on how to make that better. But we could use that for the CI pipeline, because you don't have to have, it doesn't need to be a full general purpose uh, kernel at that point. As long as it can run whatever's in the RAM disk, it, it's just whatever is in the RAM disk and you're currently using it to grab a core. If there's no core and it doesn't crash when there's no core, um, and we have a way of triggering it, because right now the way you trigger it is with a panic, I, there's a panic string we could set. Reboot. <laughs> but, but, but if you, had, yeah, if, you, if, if we, Sorry, I'm just thinking out loud too much. But if we had something like that, it could be potentially very useful and interesting um, to do. And it could be done in a number of different ways. And if we're trying to do it, I'll absolutely support that because I love that idea. Right, you just... Well, yeah, and if your RAM disk is small enough, you just boot to the RAM disk that's in there. You load the kernel, you load the RAM disk, you jump to that, you have the RAM disk, you don't have to mount anything else, you run the test, and you're done. I don't know if the, 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 the if, I don't know how deeply you can nest the Russian nesting, uh, the rescue kernels. Uh, um, Or, or you could just configure a swap partition and dump to that. I know, I know, it's not the coolest, latest thing. <laughs> yeah. So, but uh, you, we have options, I guess, is what I'm saying. Right, and we have to, we, we jump through a lot of hoops, and so it'd be nice if we can, you know, deal with that, so. All right, thank you.